Greetings from DuPage County, and thank you for checking out my presentation. I am a researcher studying singing insects and a volunteer steward in one of the forests in the DuPage County Forest Preserve District. Here are the main questions I will be addressing here. First, what are singing insects and why are they worth monitoring in the context of restoration? Second, how do restoration practices impact this ecologically diverse group of insects? Finally, if we restore it, will they come? In other words, given that we mainly are working with plants, when is that enough and when might more than that be needed? So what do I mean by singing insects? Here are the major groups. There are the crickets, the katydids, three subfamilies of grasshoppers, and the cicadas. What they have in common is that the males perform sound displays that guide females to them for mating. Nearly all of our cricket and katydid species do this, all of the cicadas and members of three subfamilies of grasshoppers. This map shows the 22 county region I have been surveying for 105 species of singing insects with counties in Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. I started this study in 2006 and plan to continue at least through 2024. Since most of these species are easily found by listening for their calling songs, they don't require trapping, netting, or even visuals for identification. Here is a recording that includes several species identifiable from a single spot. There are singing insects in every habitat type except open water. Some of these are very habitat specific and limited to high quality habitats and remnants. The longhorn band winged grasshopper needs grasslands with some open sand. The prairie cicada is limited to just a few remnants and apparently has been lost from some sites where it occurred in the recent past. The short-winged toothpick grasshopper is a western species that apparently has been lost from some sites where it once occurred. I have found it only in the Illinois Kankakee Sands Prairie. Here are three katydids of our wetlands. They only occur in marshes devoid of invasive plant species, though the long-tailed meadow katydid may occasionally go into adjacent patches of hybrid cattails. The dusky-faced meadow katydid once was abundant in every marsh, but I find it only in the relatively few sites where native wetland grasses remain common. The marsh conehead so far has proven to be common only in marshes of the Indiana dunes. Our forest species generally are in better shape, though only our better quality woodlands have some of these singing insects. The rattler roundwing's song has a distinctive rattling sound, as the name suggests, and occurs on native understory plants. The confused ground cricket lives in the litter and sometimes wanders into adjacent grasslands. The melodious ground cricket is a ground-dwelling species of floodplain forests. There are a few species most likely to be found in savanna and open woodland habitats sometimes woodland edges. The Nebraska conehead is the most widespread and abundant of these, not necessarily requiring savannas per se. The woodland meadow katydid also can expand into grasslands as long as there are woody plants present. The prairie meadow katydid is much less common, 
And so far, I have found it only in three locations, the Black Oak Savannas at Illinois Beach State Park and the Illinois Kankakee Sands had the best populations. Here are four culprits of great concern to our wetlands, and you probably are aware of the ma management challenges they pose. Wetlands that have been taken over by invasives have practically no singing insects and practically no insects at all. As the slide indicates, there are two species, the gladiator and black-legged meadow katydids, which can occur in small numbers in reed canary grass. Dusky-faced meadow katydids, as mentioned earlier, are no longer ubiquitous, and I celebrate every time I find them in a new site. Of greater concern is the stripe-faced meadow katydid. It once was known from scattered counties across my study region. I can find it in only one location now, the swales and fringes of the Dead River at Illinois Beach State Park. A large part of our effort in forest and woodland restoration involves removing invasive shrubs, notably the buckthorns and bush honeysuckles. Here are four singing insect species that live in the understory or on the ground, but you won't find them where those invasive shrubs dominate. A question that comes up with respect to invertebrates and restored prairies is the impact of controlled burns. The last forest preserve where I was stationed before I retired was Mays Lake in eastern DuPage County. Usually the several meadows, prairies, and woodlands received controlled burns in different years, but one spring they all fell on the schedule at once and essentially the entire preserve was burned. At first I was a bit concerned about this, but then I realized that there were no rare singing insects there this would be a good opportunity to assess the impact of the burns on the populations I had been monitoring for years. These were relatively good burns, about as complete as you ever get. Even so, there were areas, especially around the edges, where the burns were incomplete. Often the fire quickly burned past some taller herbaceous stems and left them untouched. So what happened? Species that lay their eggs in the soil were essentially unaffected. Species that lay their eggs in herbaceous stems and that overwinter at, as nymphs were reduced for a time, but not eliminated. As the season proceeded, I saw how survivors in the less completely burned areas spread into the completely burned areas. I concluded that as long as an entire area is not burned and populations are given time to recover, the singing insects and other species like them are compatible with controlled burns. Once sites are established, I suggest that we wait at least three years between prairie burns. Burns burn only part of the site at a time and wait two years between adjacent parts establish observable criteria for determining that a burn is needed. In other words, don't simply be slaves to the calendar, but get out on the ground and look for evidence that a burn is needed. Here are some species with limited dispersal ability, which I have found only in remnant ecosystems. Black dots in the maps are locations where these species still occur. Open circles are places where they were known historically, but no longer can be found. Cicadas are thought of as strong flyers, but the prairie cicada does not disperse. I have seen them apparently trapped within one remnant prairie that was separated from another, apparently identical patch of prairie by only a few hundred meters of low brush and wetland. The sphagnum ground cricket is limited to sphagnum bogs, which are too far apart to be reached by such essentially flightless insects. Prairie meadow katydids and stripe-faced meadow katydids likewise are stranded on habitat islands. Good dispersers are the relatively common ones. Here are examples from the four groups of singing insects. As you can see from the many dots on their maps, 
they have had no trouble maintaining populations in many places. They easily move into newly restored habitats. If you have restored an area, the important factors determining which species will find their way to your site on their own are listed here. They include items mentioned already, such as dispersal ability, proximity of population sources, and dispersal corridors. The common species will have no trouble, but what about the rare ones? Here I emphasize the extreme importance of remnant sites because often the rare species are trapped there. As remnants are allowed to degrade, their poorly dispersing residents are lost. Little work has been done with insect reintroductions, so we don't really know much about this. I have read of one successful experiment with butterflies in Europe. In our region, the Nature Conservancy successfully introduced prairie meadow katydids to the Ginsburg Prairie. Their source population was the one at Illinois Beach State Park. I wonder whether other prairie insects, such as the prairie cicada mentioned earlier, and the bush cicada, which occurs just outside our region, similarly could be introduced to restorations. I want to close with photos from some of our beautiful and precious remnants the preservation of which is, in my view, our highest priority. Here, a black oak savanna in the Illinois Kankakee Sands. Interdune swales where they occur near Lake Michigan. Remnant prairies, such as the one in the Clark and Pine Nature Preserve in Indiana. Forests and woodlands, such as Miller Woods in the Indiana Dunes National Park. Finally, here is contact information if you are interested in learning more about our singing insects. And thank you for your attention.